Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second episode of the Big Head Pod. And I'm here today with Mike Ryan, host of Your Dark Companion, and our special guest today is Mr. Jeff Fry. So, Mr. Jeff Fry, <laughs> we've talked about this for a while, of where you're where you've gone and where you are right now, to the amount of people that you've pissed off. How did you get started with this whole thing? But, well, it started as a joke. Wait a minute, started, how did you get started with what? Pissing I, people off? Yeah, yeah pissing people yeah, off. I've been doing that my whole life. And then it carried, so it carried over into the baseball aspect of the She Gone Nation. She Gone Nation. She Gone Nation. And came up with Judy the Hitting Guru, I guess because Jeff was a Judy hitter. That's right. And it, you've taken it and run with it, right? So now yeah. he's basically taken his, his, what he's done, and now he's just basically ticked as many people off as he can. Yeah. Well, I've, uh, I'm on a group chat with a couple scout buddies of mine, and we send each other these funny videos that we see on social media of some of the stuff they're teaching kids and these ridiculous drills. And so I happened to make fun of them, one of them one day, and I put it on social media, um, as a joke and these people came after me and were like hateful calling my kids names and threatening me actually had to call major league baseball security because one guy actually threatened me <laughs> called me from an unknown number went on all my facebook sent me pictures of my ex-wife and my kids and i was like what is going on with this stuff so post that video they don't really know me very well all they did was tick me off and inspire me to make another video and at the end of that video I jokingly unscripted said she gone like that and somebody goes we need to hashtag that she gone and I was like all right but what does that mean I had no clue what you know hashtagging something meant so I hashtag she gone now at the end of every video I say she gone I'm selling she gone t-shirts or giving them away I got hats and mugs and it's really just to draw attention and educate parents um, to some of the teachings out there that I believe in the long run are going to hurt their kids' development. So they're like Michael Buffer, right? Yeah. This is going to be, <laughs> you're going to be the Michael Buffer of, of, of teaching. Because you think about what, what we're taught, right? We're just teeing baseball. And now you've, you've seen some gimmicks like what, what? What catches your eye these days of what people are being taught? Well, the, they're teaching all these kids to hit the ball in the air. Everyone. And... You know, I was, a, I was a guy who was taught to not hit the ball in the air my whole life. Hence Judy. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't strong enough. I, didn't, I wasn't powerful enough to hit the ball over the, over the fence. So the only way I could be a successful hitter was to hit line drives, hit ground balls, do the little stuff, bunts, hit and runs, situational baseball, play good defense. And that's how I played for 15 years professionally. But now, because of the people that are ruining the game of baseball, in my opinion, the analytics people, um, saying that uh, ground balls are out and, you know, don't change your swing with two strikes, keep trying to drive the ball you know, over the infield or in the gaps, hit doubles and homers, that now we're going to teach everybody to hit fly balls. Well, that wouldn't, it's not going to work for everybody. It works for Aaron Judge because he's six foot seven, 280 pounds. But it wouldn't work for... And playing in a little toy ballpark. Yeah, yeah, it, it wouldn't work for... Uh, a lot of guys that are my size or stature because they can't hit the ball consistently out of the park. So I believe it's hurting kids' development, and I think so many people are buying into it, and I think it's in the long run it's going to be. So what do, they, what do they tell you to do back then? Hit line drives? Yep. Did they tell you try to hit line drives? Line drives are ground balls. Do not hit the ball in the air. No uppercut. No, I would get yelled at when I was in the Meyer Leaks for hitting the ball in the air. Because I wasn't strong enough to hit the ball out of the park. Now we also have we could also talk about the fact that the ball seems to be going a lot farther <laughs> than it used to. The equipment is way better. Balls are wound tighter for sure. Oh, I'm surprised some of these, they haven't exploded. Yet. Some of these balls are going out opposite field. It used to be when we played, only the big guys could go out opposite field. Mm -hmm. Right? Nobody was going out in old Arnton Stadium in opposite field. Unless you're Juan Gonzalez, Julio Franco, or those guys. Yeah. Now you're seeing little guys hit balls that go straight up as soon as they hit it, and somehow they carry out of the ballpark. He's like, these are, these are not the balls that I played with. When I came up to the big leagues, if I could hit one out, I had to get all of one to hit it out in BP. Yeah. You know, at the end of my career, I could hit, I hit three balls in the, in the second deck in Toronto in BP one day. And that was in 2001. 
What kind of attention did that get from your teammates? Any? Oh, no, no. It was just, I mean, it was, they knew I wasn't a power hitter and they knew I wasn't playing every day. So my, the highlight of my day was bad in practice. <laughs> so. I remember people talking about Ichiro. Ichiro could hit balls in the bleachers at will, mm -hmm. but he never, he never really tried to. He was always trying to sh you know, hit the ball over the place. And that's what I think. Do you see, think, do you think nowadays they're trying to weed out guys like you, the smaller guys that can play defense, right? Hit 250 to 280, mm -hmm. right? Play great defense. And it's, now they want guys that are, like you said, six foot five playing second base shortstop, they'll hit a uh, buck 95, 40 homers, and you'll lose 120 games. Yeah, Is that what they're trying to do? I think so. I mean, if you, if you look around the league, there's a lot, a lot of guys playing middle infield that would have never played middle infield back in the days. You know, they, they station them out in the shallow right field with a shift. And if the guy hits it a couple feet either way, they might make the play but they're more concerned about what they do in the batter's box and how many runs they can produce, and they're not worried about saving runs. The game has changed completely from when we were playing. We were, I talked about this last week with Michael just about, like you said, hitting behind guys, right? They don't do it. Now they're trying to make bases bigger, the pitch, whatever, the pitch clock, trying to just change the game. Umpire, I mean, this is what they're going to be umpiring like from here. We go, oh, hey, ball. That's all it's going to be now, and that's all it is. Why even have coaches? Why have umpires? Why not just play yourself in a video game? I know. I mean, just think of the injuries we could save, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's but are people buying into this because of the analytics? The fans aren't. I can tell you that. Attendance is down. Viewership is down all over baseball. And it's because it's, it's not entertaining, as entertaining as it used to be. No, but it's boring. But the stuff you're te like what you're trying to get out there, what kids are being taught is entertaining because I watch, I read on your posts and people are going, this people actually pay money for this, and you, it's amazing. It's amazing that that people are that naive that they think that uh, one of the, my favorite guys to to poke fun of is uh, Richard Skank, Richard Skank, Little Richie, who claims to be. Um, you know, the, the best hitting coach in all of baseball. And the only people that teach what he teaches are the people that he taught this method, this high level pattern hitting, and that one day all hitters will be hitting the way that Aaron Judge hits at six foot seven, 280 pounds. And that's what people don't understand. It's they all see guys on TV, I'm gonna hit like that guy. And you know, we've, you're not the guy on TV, don't try and be, but you're right. That's the first thing you see guys, kids dip and. And I just, I just, even you were showing some fielding stuff that you were that you were watching now too. Now it's starting to get into the fielding aspect of the game too, as well, right? Well, it's all over. It's all over. It's it's pitching, okay. Pitching, you see guys in a cage running and and, and ten steps and throwing a ball into a net and it hits ninety five miles an hour and the kids go crazy like you did something like that's going to translate to when you're actually standing on a pitcher's mound and pitching. And we've gotten away from pitching. Now we're throwing. It's, you know, that's the guys that the draft in the draft are getting drafted higher, the guys who throw the hardest. Never mind that they couldn't pitch. And you and I both know, at least for me, Manchi, the guys that I love facing were the guys that thought they could throw it by me. If the harder they threw and the straighter it was, the easier it was for me to hit. And the guys who could move it around, the Greg Maddox, the Jamie Moyers, the Tom Glavin, those guys were the most difficult guys for me to hit. Guys threw ninety seven. Fun to watch too. Yeah, guys who threw ninety seven straight as a string. We killed those guys. Let right. me ask you guys this: How did you find your identity as a player? How did you figure out this is what I am, and if I'm going to be successful in this game, this is what I've got to do. This is the way I've got to play. I think that it just started uh, from when I was a kid. I always played that way. I always was a good hitter, um, and knew I didn't have power, and would just make consistent contact, and run the base as well, and try to play good defense. And when I got out of college uh, into pro ball, I immediately saw that most of the guys I was playing with were physically stronger and more talented than I was. And I knew that I had to be as consistent as I could possibly be, not making mistakes, going out there and just trying, <laughs> trying to hit the ball hard and make the plays. And, and Every year of my career, you remember Sandy Johnson? Oh, yeah. Sandy Johnson was the assistant GM of the Rangers at the time. And somebody told him that I won the batting title in low A ball. 
and Gastonia won the batting title. And he goes, uh, I guess I can say this. He goes, who's this little shit that won the batting title? It's a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. Who's this little shit who won the batting title of Gastonia? He said, oh, that's Jeff Fry. He said, well, he better win another effing batting title or he's getting released next year. <laughs> so I knew I, I, as a minor leaguer, as a 30th round draft pick, I wasn't afforded the, uh, the chance to have a bad year. So I couldn't have a bad year. One yeah. bad year, and I'm going home. Yeah. So I never had a bad year in the minor leagues. Yeah. And then it just kept going. And, and Perry Hill, our infield instructor with mm-hmm. the Rangers, endorsed me. And he told me when I was in low A ball as a 30th rounder, and I was 22 years old in low A ball, he goes, you'll be in the big leagues by the time you're 25. And I'm like, how could he even say that? I mean, the odds of this happening are so slim. And, and what it did was inspire me to want to prove him right because I had so much respect for him. And sure enough, I made the big leagues when I was 25 years old. What about you, Kevin? How did you find out what you are and who you are as a player? I think, it, like as you said with Jeff, as a kid, I had older brothers that I looked up to. I wanted to be better than. Mm-hmm. So whatever it was they were doing, I wanted to be better than whatever they did. Whether it was, so they're 10 and 14 years older than I am. So they would throw everything they could at me as a kid. Whether playing hockey, I'm in the goal. Playing football or something, they were doing whatever I could. But I always, that was my motive. I wanted to be better than them. And it was, I'm like Jeff, I'm a blue collar guy. I played, I played hard. I played as, as hard as I could. And that's, you, just, you, you progress through that and it, it just motivates. And as, like Jeff said, you have guys that believe in you. And I was fortunate enough from the time I got into college of having coaches that played at every level of professional baseball. So I was able to, I was kind of, I guess, groomed a little bit of knowing, of one, how to carry yourself as a professional player, mm-hmm. right? Because you see a lot of these kids now with zero respect for anything. So I knew they had been hired, and I wanted to get to that level. So, all right, let me listen to what they're going to tell me to progress. Even my college coach getting the pro ball. First manager had was Bruce Crabb, played, played in the big leagues for a little bit. So I had, and each way through the, minor, through the minor leagues, I had coaches as well that played at the next le- at the major league level to be able to help me through and understand that, <clears throat> you know, my first at bat, I got, to, I think I got the uh, rookie ball and the kids showed up and the first thing they saw, they, they said, well, we got another coach. I said, man, do I look like I'm that old? <laughs> <laughs> so when Pulaski, Virginia in the, in the good old Appy League, so we get, Get there, um, get through pro, get through that my first year, and I realized that you know, you, know you, you start doing something. Maybe I can play at this level. Okay, you progress, you get to the next level. Guys are throwing a little bit harder, right? You get in the double A and A, but guys are throwing harder. Balls are moving. Now there's guys that some of them have been in the big leagues, right? So now you're starting to see, wait, can I do this? And as you just progress, you get to that point of, you know, this is this is who I am. I'm just a hard nosed player, and I and I bucked the trend when I got there because. When you were coming up, I'm sure it was what, be seen, not heard, mm-hmm. yeah? And that's what they had told me, but I was, having older brothers, I was at that point where you're not gonna, I'm gonna talk, so then yeah. it's just one of the, so I had those older guys, the Kenny Rogers, the Palmeros, the Pudges, and those guys, to be able to kind of put me in my place, but at the same time, to respect enough to know that I belonged at that level, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the hazing that people, you can't haze anybody nowadays, right? All, so we didn't time. view it as hazing. Uh-uh. It was, it was, it was, uh, Kind of a rite of passage. Yeah. Okay. You're gonna, we're gonna test you today. Okay. And we're gonna embarrass you, maybe more than you've ever been embarrassed in your life. And once you go through it and endure it, then you're one of us. And then we're gonna treat you like one of us because we all had to do it too. And now that's gone from the game because now we we can't hurt anybody's feelings anymore. Right. You know. No, we can't do that. That's not fair to. to now, Johnny. How, how did this? Manifest was was this like you know wearing a sundress on the road on a road trip or something like that? Yep, yep. There was one day every year. It was usually in September, I think, when the guys Probably got called up. Trip. When the guys got called up, and it's like, oh, this next road trip, last road trip, we're gonna dress you guys up as superheroes. And I remember when I was in Boston, <laughs> we dressed up like six guys as superheroes and dropped them off like five blocks from the hotel, and they had to walk down the street in their superhero outfits. <laughs> but once they did, we welcomed them as, as, you know, as us and, and put our arm around them and said, man, you took that well. And, and the guys who didn't accept it, you know, there was always one guy who fought it. I'm not doing that or whatever. He just kind of alienated himself from the rest of the team. Yeah, kind of like one of the strike breakers, right? They're with yeah. the union type of thing. I had to, uh, we were in New York, we were at Yankee Stadium. 
So they had, we had, it was pimps and hoes. <laughs> so we had some guys that were just under a year, but were up the year before. So they had already, so we were, I was in a pink halter top, I think a blue mini skirt. And I had to go, you know, when you walk out of Yankee Stadium to the oh, left, yeah. there's 300 fans waiting for autographs. Who so were over there signing autographs for fans. <laughs> and those guys, you know, you walk up and then I had to wear, and then I served food on the plane on the ride home. So, I mean, that's just, that's just a part of it. And either you look at it, you can either fight it where you sit or accept it. And, and that's what it is. And you, you moved on. You take it on the chin. And, but they had different stuff. They had, what, the three-man lift, right, that they oh, would yeah. do. They'd have different stuff in the clubhouse. They'd do the hot foots on people. I mean, now it just nobody wants to mess around and do any of that stuff with anybody. So there's and after no... the game, everybody leaves 10 minutes after the game now. We used to hang out for an hour and have a couple beers and talk about what happened in the game. We talked the game, talked shop. And now it's who can be the first one out of the locker room back to his room playing video games. There's no beer either. I know. I found that out the hard way when I went to Boston. I showed up in Boston, um, and after the first game I played there, I was like, where's the beer? They're like, oh, we're not allowed to have beer in locker room. I was like, what do you mean you're not allowed to have beer in locker room? Yeah, a couple guys got tickets last year or whatever, so they outlawed beer in the locker room. I was like, well, I didn't know this shit. I would never come play for you guys because I need a beer <laughs> after the game to calm down. Yeah, we're in Milwaukee. About right mm-hmm. in the Where's the beer? No, it's all it's all gone because somebody had done something else that. So it's just yeah, you know I don't want a neutral grain bar or anything. I want a cold beer, right? That's I need a thing. smoothie after the game. No, I need to calm down and. But you're right. You we would sit there and just and just do this. Guys would sit in their you know and just in their slides and their in their slides and their shirts and just sit there and, and eat, hang out, talk, whatever. Some guys would go hit or some guys would watch video. But we talked about the game. Yeah. And what happened? What we would do differently? Maybe we handled the situation poorly, or we you know we were thinking wrong, whatever. And we talked about it, and it helped us get better the next time we had that situation come up. And they don't do that anymore. It's just that. What do they do then? Play video games and they look at their iPads and dug out after every at bat. So, uh, you know, thankfully we didn't have that stuff. You know, I can remember in Boston, this is a funny story. I remember <laughs> I would only go up in Boston. It's not like you, it was easy to get to the video room. You had to go through the tunnel, across the walkway where the fans are, into the locker room, around all the way to the weight room, to the back of the weight room where the. There was two TVs and VCR tapes. So if you wanted to see uh, an at-bat or some pitches, I would only go up there to see if I felt like the umpire made a bad call on me, if it was a strike or not a strike. And so you didn't have much time. You had to run up there, and I was pissed one time. This guy called what I thought was a bad pitch on me, and I went up there, and I was like, Billy, rewind that pitch. Billy Broadbent, never forget it. And I was like, oh, that's a ball. And my nickname was Frito. Mike Stanley gave me that. And he goes, that looks like a pretty good pitch, Frito. And I was like, listen, mother effer. <laughs> I said, I don't give a shit if you think that's a strike or not. Okay? I say it's a ball. It's an effing ball. You understand me? And he goes, I'm sorry, Frito. I'm sorry, Frito. <laughs> so every time I see Billy Broadbent, I say, what was that pitch, Billy? He goes, that's a ball, Frito. <laughs> but just for your mental, your mental, you know, I still have two or three maybe more at-bats in that game, and I want to feel like I know that was a bad pitch. Maybe this umpire is going to make up for it later in the game. Now I'm sure you get like a spray chart of, not a spray oh, yeah. chart of the field, but of balls and strikes, weather called. Spin rate. And it's just, and I can't even imagine, it, there's probably an app or something that the umpires get where they can actually go through and go, how was I graded today? On, And it's just, because I remember Quest Tech was starting when we were, right? They had the, the two cameras that were, but it never really, it, I, I never really even understood it because you'd have umpires, even if they would miss, come up next to that, hey, I missed something or it was a bad play. And now it's just everything. I mean, they have instant replay down to the Little League World Series now, and there's, 10,000 camera angles, so you can't get away, away from anything, any of that stuff. And a lot of times it's, they get it, still get it wrong. It's like, why do we have instant replay in the game? And why are you not allowed to challenge this play, but you are this one? Like there was a play the other day where uh, Guerrero tagged a guy on a rundown, clearly tagged him. The umpire called him safe, run scored, but they didn't have any challenges left. Meanwhile, the two games before, two days before, the Rangers challenged a sly, a stolen base attempt at second base where the guy maybe came off the base for a millisecond and the guy kept the tag on us like, this is what we got instant replay? I think we got instant replay when 
Derek Jeter hit that home run in Yankee Jeffrey Stadium. Mayer? In Jeffrey Yan- Mayer? In Yankee Stadium, and the guy, uh, you know, reached over the fence or whatever. He's like, that's, we want to get the big calls right in a game. Maybe the game changing, like when the Galarraga had the perfect game and the umpire blew it at first base. Jimmy Joyce. Jim Joyce. And, and so if we'd have had challenges back then, the guy would have clearly had a perfect game. But now we're challenging some things and not others, and I, I think it should all go away, if you ask me. I doubt that you guys are going to be on board with this, but I really felt bad for Jim Joyce after that. I just saw something the other day on social media about somebody trying to file a petition to get it overturned. This oh, happened, really? what, 10 years ago? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the thing, human error. It's just, it's it's a mistake. Jimmy even owned up to it that oh, next yeah, day. He oh, he even was crushed. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what totally brought me around on him. The fact that he owned up to it, he talked often about how he was tormented by that and everything. Uh-huh. And, I mean, he really handled it the right way, I thought. He, he was did. in tears. He was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he I, well, I remember Jimmy Joyce hosed me on a play in Minnesota. You know when you're in a blowout game sometimes, it's a close play, yeah, the team that's get, winning. Yeah. So I, I clearly beat out an infield single in like a 10-run game. <laughs> and uh, I walked out to the field, and he goes, he was coaching, I mean, umpire in first, he goes, I owe you one. I was like, all right, we're good. I still would have rather had the hit, but okay, you owe me one. So the next day, B, I check swing, and they appealed Jim Joyce, and he goes, <laughs> strike, and I was like, dude, I thought you owed dude. me one. <laughs> <laughs> I never, he still owes me one to this day. Mr. Jim, what a great, I mean, you, there were some great umpires you could actually have that kind of conversation with to do it. Jimmy was one of those guys, Mr. Hi. He'd never back. He'd get back there. Everybody had their own little stick that would do it. But now it's just you can't even approach an umpire. You can't even talk to him without no, uh, no arguing this and that. Well, what's the point of even having an interaction before a game? Well, they won't be here much longer. We're gonna. Well, they'll be out there. But we're, apparently, we're gonna go to the robo umps at some point with our new the, commissioner. They're doing them right now, right in the Atlantic League or something. Yeah, in the minor leagues. Yeah. No, in real minor leagues, they're doing them. Really? Robo umpire. Yep. And some of these calls are not even close. And the hitters are like, you're out. And it's like the catcher's laughing. And now they're also doing the pitch clock. You've seen that. Ah, yes. The pitch clock. Have you seen this? Yeah. I mean, where the batter has to be in the box ready to hit when the pitch clock hits nine seconds. And if he's not, it's a strike. Which is never going to be approved by the players. You know that in yeah. major leagues. They're never going to approve that. The well, only way it would be is if Manfred... It just unilaterally said, "This is the new rule." Because it was, we were, I think it was a video you had showed the kid from Midland, the rock, rock, mm-hmm. the kid. So when you take a swing, you're allowed to take a step out of the box for a second. And he did. He he wasn't out of the box more than about four seconds. Came back in. Second strike was on the check mm-hmm. swing. Came back. He could step right back in the box. The umpire what rung him up for yeah. Not- and the catcher was still giving the signs <laughs> to the pitcher, and this guy's getting ready, and all of a sudden the ump goes, "Strike three, and the batter's like. You just walk back to the dugout. That's what it's called. It, it doesn't. You don't even have a. Ch- there's no, there's no chance to even defend yourself with 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 okay. anything. You, right, would now, you have I'll, accepted that? No, but all, I'd have been thrown out. Yes. Oh yeah. But all this said, doesn't pace of game of the game need to be addressed? I, th- I don't. I don't think so. Because when we played, and you, I know you're a baseball fan. Back when we played, were you bored watching a baseball game? Never. Because we were, and, and I, I'm not bored now either. But this is not about me because right. I am a baseball fan. Right. But you know, the they, casual they, they, fan can't yeah, watch. They have to pander at some point to the average spare guy who is not into this game to quite the degree that you and I are. Mm-hmm. And I think at some point that's got to be addressed, and it better be addressed. I think sooner rather than later. Well, think about it. they. Is it this year they're doing the universal DH everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. The average pace of play for a National League game was just over, or, or maybe just under three hours, but an American League game was three and a half. Fifteen or something. So, I'm no mathematician, but wouldn't that mean you would rather go with the pitchers hitting to shorten the game length, one, mm-hmm. to do it that way? But now they go the other way, and then they're trying to, like you said, pitch clocks, uh, Size of the bases. Are they going to do it like softball at first base? You're going to have two bases now where you can't, there's not. There's, You're even limited on the amount of times you can throw over on a pickoff attempt. 
And right third now, time, after the third time, if you don't pick the guy off, the guy gets to go to second. It's a balk. So the other day, the guy threw over three times. The third time at first, the guy was safe. The guy on first went to second. The guy on third went home on the pickoff attempt. You wonder why I don't watch it anymore. Well, I, I think, <laughs> I think uh, like you said, the, the, uh, the pace of play, I don't think that's the issue. I think it's the lack of action in the game that is making it boring. And if there's action going on and, and stolen base attempts are more frequent and mm -hmm. hit and runs and bunts and squeeze, when have you seen a squeeze play in the last two years? Yeah. Ever. And right? I, I realize pace of play is kind of a, a handy way to disguise that a little bit. But regardless of that, I think it's something that's got to be addressed here. I mean, they have to start pandering to the average spare fan that doesn't get into this game to quite the degree that you guys and I do, mm -hmm. you know? Well, what they're doing now is they're advertising more on television. So you have all these gambling sites, DraftKings, and on the back yeah. of the mound you'll yeah. see Roman, an erectile dysfunction <laughs> drug advertised on the back of a pitcher's mouth. They do know their audience, don't yeah, they? Yeah, so what about 12-year-olds that are sitting there watching the game with their daddy going, Daddy, what is Roman? Uh, <laughs> sorry, son. I'll tell you when you're older. You're right. It's going to become yeah. NASCAR. All sports are doing that. I think hockey's going to it when the helmets and everything. It's just, it's going to be, or, uh, or is it UFC or somebody where they have, there's just... I don't know if it's they a box. They have tattoos of advertising. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's what it becomes. It's more of a, it, and that's what it is. It's more of a, it's not even a, it's a baseball game. It's a social event and there's a baseball game going on. So if we're advertising more and more and more on TV, all these DraftKings and, and, and all these Roman and certain things, why do we want less time on TV? We want the game to last longer, right? Because you can actually bet during games now on oh, the odds of this guy getting a hit are five to one. You want to bet 10 bucks? Right? But meanwhile, the all-time hit leader in the game of baseball is not in the Hall of Fame for gambling. That's not hip, hypocritical, is it? Like, we have deals with MGM and all this stuff. I mean, who's the uh, uh, Charlie Blackman has a deal with a casino for advertising now. And how is that not yeah, considered? Yeah, but Pete Rose is not in the Hall of Fame. What are your thoughts on that, Air Reiner? No, no, on uh, Pete Rose. On, on Pete that, Rose? On being an, I was a huge fan of his, but at the time, I thought he, he tampered with the fabric of the game. And therefore, I, I, don't, I don't know if he deserved quite the stiff punishment that he has faced, like be, being banned for life or however they put it. But I think now he's paid his dues and he should be allowed back in, especially if you're going to have all this other gambling stuff in there. If gambling is going to become a part of the fabric of the game, then okay, let's let Pete Rose back in. Because he, what's what he did on the field? The gambling happened as a manager. As a manager, right? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's and that's a record that'll never be touched. And here's the guy who was maybe one of the biggest overachievers to ever play this game, right? He wasn't physically gifted. He worked his way to becoming the all-time hit leader. Yeah, with consistency and hard work and not striking out and. You know, he made a mistake gambling. Um, we all agree that that was a mistake. But as a player, he was a Hall of Famer. Oh, yeah. No question. And he was a huge fan hot button, too. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a very polarizing figure who, if you were a Reds fan or from that part of the world, you absolutely loved I mean, you would die for that guy. And but he, a lot of people out there in the hinterlands were just as opposed to him. They hated him. And he would die for his team. You, uh, you think about how hard he played. And yep. for him to play 20-plus some odd years, I mean. All out. Yes. Yeah, we're not talking. You know, that now these, these guys have these little pop-up <laughs> chest slides. Pete Rowe wasn't. He was jumping up to slide down. And that's just how he, he just played that game. I mean, He was he, running over Ray Fossey in the All-Star game. Yes, in the All-Star game. Because it mattered. Game. Yeah, exactly. Because it was bragging rights, which league is better back then. And then, then he went to the. What, whoever wins the, the all-star game was... Uh, it's home field. Home field, home field advantage. Then it was, uh, we're only going to limit the game to a certain amount of innings, and then we're going to... You know, so many things have changed, like you mentioned, the fabric of the game. Now, you know, when we played, we were taught um, by the guys before us that you didn't show up the other team, no matter what. And if you did, as a young kid, somebody was going to come up to you and say, listen, 
you didn't get one of your teammates hurt by hot dogging. Yeah. And so we didn't do it. Now they're encouraging it to happen in the game. You know, I posted a video today of Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer, um, we know he's been banned from the game for two years mm -hmm. for off the field stuff. Fair or not, I don't know. Um, but now he has uh, got this deal on TikTok where he's encouraging minor league players to pimp home runs or do something stupid on the field, showboating. And it, the, the, the third one today where he's paying kids 2500 um, bucks to basically pimp homers or try to embarrass the other team. And he's encouraging it on social media. Because he's angry? You think? Least, uh, yeah, I'm sure he is angry. I'd be angry too if I lost $60 million in contracts <laughs> and banned from the game for two years. I just, you, you see that a lot with kids. I mean, you've shown some videos of kids with these bat flips and, and everything else. And, and I, I'm coaching, I've never run up the score unless it's warranted, right? Mm -hmm. Because you run those coaches complete, all right, that dude's an asshole from what he's, what he said to his kids. And, now we're running the score up. This is a guy we're going to run the score up. Mm -hmm. And the kid, you know, kids who, and we don't tell them that. It's just I tell my coaches that this is one of those times, right? Because it's just, and it, you want to. It's just to prove a point to say because you you hear how so many parents, even coaches, talk to kids. And how do you cursing at your kids and this and that? You're going, what are you what are you instilling in these kids? Yet here they come. We'll keep paying them money because they're gonna they're gonna do they're gonna get my kid to X level with the D1, hitting stuff. D one scholarship. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I posted a video the other day of some parents yelling at an umpire. There, I don't know if you know this, Ryan, but there's an umpire shortage in amateur baseball. Yes, I do know that. Because parents and coaches are yelling at these guys at Little League games, at these umpires. Like this poor umpire who's a 20-year-old college kid making 30 bucks a game is really out there trying to screw one team over. Okay, But parents have lost their minds, and they're yelling at these people, and this one guy followed this kid out to the parking lot yelling at him the other day over a little league game that he had enough and he said that's it I've told you to be quiet you're not game over your team forfeits and, and in my opinion parents are ruining amateur sports and it's been growing and growing and now it's where it's almost unwatchable and what a horrible example they're setting for their kids and they, they think they get it from the TV where you said you have these all these angles of well, that guy missed that call by this much. So I'm able to go to my kids' little league game where you're sitting behind an umpire where you can't see a plate and you're going up and you see the catchers move and oh, that's a strike, this and that. And you just, I, I don't even know how you explain it. I, it's, it's, a, it's a hard enough job and, and I get it. I get that part of it. I just, I just want the umpire or officials and ever to, if you're going to be out there, be out there not just to grab a paycheck, be out there to be out there, right? Mm -hmm. To make, you, you want those umpires to say, or soccer, whatever whatever it is, hey, guys, explain, especially younger kids, if they do something wrong, explain it to, okay, I got it, we, we understand that. But by being bad and you're not helping anybody else, you're mm -hmm. just irritating people. I did a, a first pitch one time for a little league, we're talking five-year-olds, introduced, they might meet, meet some parents around and everybody introduced them to this guy, hey, Bill, Nice to meet you. I say, hey, what, what, you know, what is, what's your job? He goes, my job is just to talk to all these parents. I said, about what? He says, uh, to make sure that they just chill out. I said, this is t-ball. He goes, yeah, I know. Game seven of the World Series for, for five-year-olds for t-ball. And like you said, they're, they're D1 athletes at, at five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At five years old. They've got to worry about people chilling out. I guess. I mean, and when you have to hire a chill-out coach. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's your job. Just walk, make sure everybody does the woosah. Right? Yeah. They, they woosah. Yeah, right here. They need, they need to have signs when you walk in the ballpark. No yelling at umpires, none of this. Okay? Coaches, it's your responsibility to control your parents. Okay? Your parents are yelling at the umpire. You need to go there. Like I did when I was coaching my kids in Little League, and the parents would get a little unruly. I'd walk over, and I'd go, shh. Cheer for your kids. We got this yeah. over yeah. here. Don't be coaching don't, them. Don't make this any harder spot. on them than it is. Yeah, so they're already putting so much pressure. We're putting pressure on them to perform and to know where they're be, supposed to be in the right situation. We're trying to teach them how to, like we were taught, and yet mom and dad are out there going, let's go, two-strike approach, you know, yelling all this, all these instructions and stuff. It's like, shut up and let your kids play. And that, you know, that if, I know I did a good job if your kid wants to come back and play next year. 
That's it. Yeah. And they had fun. Yeah. Did you ever have an umpire explain anything to you? Like, if we at ever, any level? Yeah, or, or just at, at, at the major league level. Were you ever involved in a play that was kind of weird and you were left wondering, okay, exactly what happened there? And you'd ask him for, and maybe he would take it upon himself to explain it to you. If, we were talking about balls and strikes, right? Because we, we know, yeah. we pretty much know what pitches are, are yeah. good and what, what's not. And then, right, yeah, it would probably be, probably be more likely to be balls and strikes than anything else. Yeah. Did you ever have that? Oh, yeah, I had a couple. I had uh, a guy named Jim McKeon. I don't know if you remember Jim McKeon. One of the funniest, one of the funniest interactions I ever had with the umpire, with, with an, an umpire. I'm facing Sean Bosky in Fenway, and he throws a pitch off the plate outside that I thought was a ball, but he called a strike. I'm like, all right, he's going to go out this far. Mm -hmm. Now I know I have to adjust. Yep. And then he throws one inside a little bit off the plate, and he calls that a strike too. And I just turned around, and I said, you can't effing give him both. He ain't Cy Young. He goes, well, you ain't Babe Ruth either. And I was like, you're right. I'm not. I turned around and started hitting. <laughs> you know? Because they never forgot that. They used to have American and National League umpires, right? Uh-huh. Until they started integrating everybody. And you would have, because like when Eckersley would pitch, you'd see ball, you know, this far off the plate. Maddox. You just, yeah. Yeah. You didn't, you never, you never really had a chance. You were up there. They wanted to see you to swing the bat. I had something like that happen with uh, McClellan, Tim McClellan one night. I took a, I thought it was a ball four. It was strike three on the outside corner. You know, you get, you just take your bat and your helmet. You just, I just dropped it down. I went, I dropped it. Let me take my stuff off. He goes, Menchie, what was that for? I said, I should have swung. <laughs> I was pissed. I didn't say anything. Right. I was just pissed because I'm like, I didn't want to say. Just because, you know how he was just, mm-hmm. he just had that demeanor. Just, yeah, I should have swung. I walked and just walked. But you know, those are the guys you could actually. I had Marvin Hudson one night too. Like next to bat, he came up after he missed something. He's just he walk, as I walked around. He's like, "Hey, let me just let you know, I missed the last one." Hey, man, perfect, right? You, it's, that's what you want to see. But now it's just you don't even get a chance to even look. Yeah. It's you know, I'm sure I can't imagine what's being said. Do you know how many Instagram followers I have? And you're going to call yeah. that crap, <laughs> yeah. right? Because then they're going to crush you. Yes, they are. Yeah, and they're, that's and that's what I mean. But even the um, they're just their hands are tied when it comes to any of that stuff. And it's yeah. that. And then uh, now the big talk is the. Uh, the baseball is the grip. You're talking mm-hmm. about... Fighter I'd, tech. I'd much rather... Would you much rather have some dude throwing 120 miles an hour not know where he goes and you know, give him some tack? So at least he had... Like Kenny. Well, they all had it anyway. Yeah. They all had little pine tar rags oh, in, yeah. their, in their pockets of their jackets and stuff. And you know, there was just... I call it trade craft back then, right? Because everybody had a little something. Okay? Some of the hitters would do stuff too. I, I took the... Remember those big metal pins for your personal bags? Yeah. Right? I took mine and I pushed the grooves down on my bat, about eight grooves. And oh, I pushed them down. Pushed them down. So it was like a golf club. And I had a line drive right past the pitcher, smoked it, like running the first base hit. And the sucker got back spinning and carried all the way to center fielder. I was like, well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. But the pitchers, you know, they all had their little stuff like that. And we didn't mind as long as nobody got caught. That was the key. Don't get caught doing it. Now you see who's a Severino had pine tar on his I, neck I at did. Yankee Stadium, and and Garrett Cole, you know, it's got a, a brown spot on his leg back here that after every pitch he goes to. It's like they're not very smart about about that kind of stuff. One, one I want to tell you, you remember Durwood Merrill? Sure, absolutely. Durwood Merrill. Um, we all love Durwood. I mean, he's a legendary umpire from, I think, like Texarkana, Texas or something. And and uh, he had a pretty big strike zone later in his career. And he called a pitch on me one time. And I was like, Durwood, that's not a pitch. That's not a strike. He's like, Hall of Fame pitch. Hall of Fame pitch. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm but, not going to the Hall of Fame <laughs> if you call those pitches on me because I can't even reach it. I, I, remember, you, I remember that with hitting, you know, somebody would throw a ball on you, and you'd ask, you'd ask the umpire, hey, is that as far out as you're going to yeah. go? Just so you would know, right? Because you remember those days when Posada or somebody, he would they'd show the umpire like he was sitting there, he'd reach his glove, and all of a sudden, right when he would slide, he would set, he'd almost act like he was setting the outside corner with his glove, and then he would slide out, and he'd be this far off the plate, and he'd get calls mm-hmm. because those guys, you're right, they're veteran guys that knew how to, how to work the system, mm-hmm. right? Now, you're not getting any of that stuff. You're not getting... Plus, the the pitchers, most of the pitchers that we talked about, like Maddox, Eckersley, Glavin, those guys have been in the league a long time, and they earned 
the respect. They got Nolan Ryan. They got a bigger strike zone sometimes, okay, because they've been around and they put in the years. And so you, you knew going into a game that with this guy on the mound, I better be ready to expand the strike zone because a pitch that would this far off the plate for one guy might be this far off for Eckersley or Glavin or Maddox, and he's going to call it. And so we just had to adjust. But now what you see with the K-Zone on TV, there's pitches that are missing that K-Zone by this much that were strikes on us every time that they're not calling strikes. And my question is, why is the league batting 233 as a lead if the strike zone is smaller? Because of people like Richie. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how is it possible? You know, we used to hit 260, 270 as a league, right? If, if you couldn't hit 250 in the big leagues, Unless and a, unless you were a stellar defensive player, you're in the minor leagues. Yeah. Now, guys, Joey Gallo's in his sixth year in the big leagues with a 205 career batting average. 205. Yeah, but he hits home runs. When he hits it, it goes far. Yeah. And now I'm a little bit of a Joey Gallo defender here. I love the guy, and I hated to see him go. He's a true outcome guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he takes walks too. Now he yep. strikes out. He'll never hit for a high average, but he hits the ball out of the ballpark and he takes walks, and he's a good defensive player. Very good. At several positions. Very good. Very good defensive player. So what but he's that? one of the players that one out of five times something's going to happen good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's not entertaining. No, it's not entertaining. But just as far as his viability, look at the total package, and he's a very viable guy. All right, here it is. So, Ronnie, here's the question. What do you pay a guy like that, then? Well, are home runs the coin of the realm in this game? You're a general manager, and you're going to offer him a contract. Here comes here comes Jeff Fry. He's got a 205 career average. He averages 45 homers, 100 RBIs a year. Teams he's been on, lose more games than they win. Can play defense. What okay. Are your, what are your? I'm just saying stuff all you take right, into consideration. All right. What's he making right now? About 18 million. Okay. If contract time comes up, I don't know. I'd throw 25 out there and see if he takes it. Just one year deal? Or are you talking? He's about to be a free agent. He's, he's going to want five yeah. or six years. Yeah. 160 million. Is that somebody you build yeah. your team around? Yeah. I, I I try to build my team around him. I think he's a, a guy that you can, or put it this way, he's got to have the right other parts because there's there are holes in his game. There's a lot of weakness in his game. And you've got to have some other guys who can do the things he can't. But if you have those guys, then he becomes a very value, valuable component, I think. And he's a guy that you extend for. Well, so the Rangers, he was their guy. How yep. did that work yeah, out? He, he, right. Well, <laughs> not very well. And then when you go to the Yankee Stadium, you go to the Yankees, and you have Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stanton, Rizzo, and some of these other guys, LeMahieu. Well, then maybe it'll work. But then you got to have a two hundred eighty dollar, two hundred eighty million dollar payroll. But if you're a team with a hundred and fifty million dollar payroll, and you're paying one guy one fifth of that, and he only hits two hundred, you lose a hundred games a year. Yeah, but if he, if if he hits home runs. And you build your team right in other areas. I think you can withstand that. I guess it depends on how you can't hit ten run homers, which is what a lot of guys try and do, right? Dug down. No, you can't. Right. Hit. And it uh, comes down to what's around you, but and also is he good for the core group of guys there? Because when we were playing, right, Jeff, we had you had younger, but you also had those veteran guys who were going to jump your ass if needed to be, right? They're going to throw you in the corner, and. Is he somebody you want to build around? Is that somebody that says, hey, get off your computer and get over here type of thing? Or is this going to be lead everybody by doing the same thing? And that's what I mean. What do you what do you build a team around these Well, that, that, that's another thing. That's yeah. another thing that would factor into the equation for yeah. me. I mean, I want somebody who gives a shit. Yeah. I want somebody who will take charge in the room. I want somebody who will call guys out when they're not playing the game or, or, or comporting in the right way. So, question for you, Jess. So, You've been around long enough to know when guys are going into contract years, what are they doing? They're worried about themselves. And what? And they're just going off, aren't they? Oh, yeah, well. Right? They hope to. But That's a lot of times they, they put you pre- can... Yeah, you're trying to put up this big year so that you can fire your agent and hire Scott Boris 
and get a big free agent. Yeah. The great Satan. You can get a big free agent uh <laughs> The contract. baseball antichrist. Yeah, he is. Yeah, ask, ask Randy Galloway. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's but that's you see that now. And then what happens, though, on this, usually on the next day when they get that deal? Yeah, then the first year, they're, they look like they never played baseball. Yeah. It's just, but that's what that's what it's come down to now. It's all about the, the loyalty from. Yeah, from I know, a, from I know. A, right, who was the last guy really to stick with a team? I mean, Mike Trout will probably be will mm-hmm. stick with with uh, the Angels, probably through, hopefully throughout his career. But I mean, you don't see the Tony Gwynns and the Cal Ripons playing twenty plus odd year for the same organization because, and that's what fans are, are used to familiarity. Yeah, the same people. I, you I don't see that in any sport hardly, though. No. I mean, there are, in football, there are a few guys like Aaron Rodgers. He's spent his whole career in one place. Um, you know, Peyton Manning pretty much did. Um, but you don't see that anymore. I think we could thank LeBron. Yeah, I think I think we can. Yeah. For, for, I mean, I, I, tell, I tell people all the time, Luka Doncic is not going to stay here. I hope he does. <laughs> well, I hope he does, too. Look at Dirk did. Yeah, Dirk, I, don't know, I don't know that Cuban Dirk will did, let but, but, but Dirk is cut from another cloth entirely. But he's molding Luca, along with I believe with the is. other guys that are there. You know, Jalen Brunson as well. The same you having those guys that, and that's what that's what fans like to see. They want to build a core. This the same core guys. Grant, you're gonna have pieces coming in and out. But when, as soon as like I said, teams win championships, what happens that next year? They come in there, they pluck coaches. Everybody, oh, they have the pedigree, and these guys all want to get paid, and they're all gone. Yeah. Right? They don't. There's. They don't stick around. You, I, you do see it. I see it a little bit. Uh, let's take Tampa Bay Lightning, for instance, in hockey. I mean, the last two Stanley Cups they've won, and that team really hasn't had much turnover. Mm-hmm. It's a piece here and a piece there. It's almost as if I don't know if Steve Eisenman is still the general manager, but they've bought into the concept of, hey, I'll take a, a pay cut to make sure that you guys can come in and help because on the back end, the money that raises for the, hey, and that's what it's about. It's. I don't think it's about winning anymore. As it used to be when we were there. We were trying to win, yeah, granted. But am I going to sleep well at night not knowing I didn't win? No, I'll be fine. But I think that's what now it's not. It's not about the winning part. That's what I see. I mean, is that what you guys see? Yeah, you see guys leaving teams that they've been on and been successful at to just go to a new team. Look at Tyreek Hill. Why did he leave Kansas City? To go sign for his maximum contract somewhere else. And, and, and some of these great receiving receivers in the NFL that are just – the loser is the guy that left Green Bay. Devontae Adams? Yeah, him and Aaron Rodgers were like the best I combination. Like that, man. And then next thing you know, he's what, in the Texans or something? He, he leaves to go, or the Raiders, I think. He yeah, left Raiders. to go to the Raiders. It's like, why, if you winning was important to you, would you go from the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers to the Oakland Raiders? Because winning is not what it's about. It's about making the money you can make in the short amount, the small window that you have to yeah. be a professional and, athlete. And, and in football, I kind of understand that a little bit mm-hmm. because you don't have the long career that you do in these other sports, and it can be over for you just like that yeah. in football. One play. Yeah. Same how, I mean, all, in, all, in all the sports, you, you just, but right, everything. Yeah, that applies, that applies yeah. to other sports yeah, but, too, but especially football. Yeah. The loyalty's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and as a fan base, I mean, when you're seeing your favorite players leave year after year after year, it's hard to to cheer for those guys. It's like, yeah. well, who are these new guys? And well, now we got, uh, as Ranger fans, I know we had a you know big off season, spent like half a billion dollars on two players, and one of them is failing miserably right now somehow. You know, the guy who hit. I don't even want to say his name because I heard he's a great guy, but how does a guy who hit 45 home runs last year? A month and a half into the season, have zero the next year. Strange. I mean, makes you wonder. Menchie, if you had a bad year, a good year for you was what? 290, 300, 280, right? If you hit 260, 250, you felt that was below your Yeah, you your know, standard. You sh- right. But can you imagine? Okay, you know, and that's if you hit 20 points lower than your career average or whatever, it's a bad year. Now guys are hitting 100 points lower or 120 points lower in one year. It's like, that has to be mental. How else can this guy, who's clearly a star player, go from Bellinger? Look what happened to Bellinger. Bellinger was MVP two years later. He hit 156. How, do you, how does that happen? Do they just 
uh, get eaten up with hidden home runs, or, or how does that's it? That's part of it. That's part of it. Could be too, though. If, if think about it, if, if when like Rudy was here, if something was wrong, you could tell. Like you said, you're hitting below. So there's something wrong. He knew you, you had Rudy to go to, right? And, mm-hmm. and the, now, if it's if, if something's wrong, okay, I got to hear from you. I got to hear from you. I got to hear from you. From you, you're getting all these different too much. Information. Yes, yeah. and it's too yeah. much information, and you're over overthinking it as opposed to wait, like you just like. The Shigong Nation, they're making this harder than it is. Mm-hmm. And I think that and that's you know what your I think your whole concept was just it's not that hard, guys. It's not. Yeah, it's, you just make it that hard. And it's and that's what you see it regardless of whatever whatever sport it is. Paralysis by analysis. <laughs> so I know I mean when we played, we had six coaches on the staff. You had you know the manager, bench coach, pitching coach, hitting coach, infield coach, outfield coach. That's it. Okay, How you many didn't behind- go to, you didn't go to the pitching coach to ask about hitting. But how many behind the scenes guys were there? Any? None. No, I mean, you One, might have a rover or two in the minor leagues or whatever. Guys come up, guest coaches. But now there's two or three hitting coaches, two or three pitching coaches. So if you're in a slump, who are you going to go to? This hitting coach is saying you need to do this, and this guy is saying you need to do this. Back then, we went to Rudy or whatever hitting coach. If I was having a fielding slump, I'd go to Perry Hill. What am I doing wrong? I didn't have two or three different opinions. So now some kids don't want to offend a coach and they're going to listen to everything. So I'm going to listen to what you say about hitting. Then I'm going to listen to what this guy says. And now I'm in between. I'm all screwed up in my head. And now I'm hitting 150. Like you said, as soon as you put your bat back in the rack, you've got your, they get their iPad and they're looking at it. All right, where was this pitch, this and that, and overanalyzing the whole swing as opposed to you walk in for a second, you look, and you're pissed off, and you come back out. You know what you did wrong. You yeah. don't have to look at it at the video. Did you yeah. see the hockey game the other day? Where the guy came in, he missed a, he missed a goal, uh, missed a shot. So he went in on the bench and he grabbed that little tablet to look at what happened on that play, and his teammate grabbed it and threw it. Oh yeah, I, did. I was like, that is <laughs> I awesome. See that? I forgot about I that. I love that. It's like, you know why you missed that? You don't have to look at it on a replay. And so, as a, as a baseball player, don't you always watch what's happening on the field? You never miss a miss a pitch unless you have to run to the bathroom or get it something out of the locker room, you're trying not to miss a pitch of the game. You want to see what's happening. You want to see how this guy's pitching this guy, two strikes. So if I, when I get up there, I want to know how he's going to pitch me. Now they go in the dugout, and they don't even watch the game. They're looking at this iPad in the dugout, their last at bat. Well, that's over. That's in the past. How about let's watch what my teammate's doing right now yeah. so I can know what's going to happen to the next guy or the next guy and not worrying about myself and why I failed on this at bat or this pitch. All right, now here's something I've always wondered. How can you guys sit in the dugout and watch an at bat, watch a guy, a pitcher pitch into a hitter and watch how the hitter goes about his business of trying to, you know, get a hit. How can you sit in the dugout on the bench and tell what the ball's doing from that angle? Or tell what's going on out there between the two of them. We've seen a lot of pitches <laughs> our whole life. Yeah, is... yeah, I, I, I guess that's it. But, man, I, I, for the life of me, I can't imagine how you do that. Well, now they've made it easier because you can look at the radar and know what the pitch is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Back then, we didn't have, at least uh, in my career, toward the very tail end, they started putting the radar up on the scoreboard. Um but like in Boston, I would, before I went up to hit, when I was walking up to, to hit, not knowing how hard this guy was throwing, except maybe the scouting report before the series, know this guy throws 90 to 93, whatever. So I would have, our scout would be behind home plate with a radar gun. And as I'm walking up to home plate in Fenway, I'd look at him, and he knows I'm looking for him, and he would hold up two fingers, 92, or he'd hold two down, 88. So I would have an idea of the velocity he's yeah. throwing at, but now it's so easy. Uh, that's another reason that I still can't believe these guys can't hit 250 in the big leagues. They have all the technology. They have all these resources. If you go, I went into the new stadium. It's incredible the stuff they have, the weight room, all this, the nutrition, everything that we didn't have. You know, on a Sunday day game, we're going in. I'm eating two sinkers, two donuts, and a cup of coffee. We're going to get them. Now you go and you have this gourmet breakfast and you have a protein shake and you have you can look at your iPad to see what the pitcher's throwing before you go up and hit. And we still can't hit. 
And all that, in my mind, points to the fact that they've changed their approaches. Now we're not worried about just making contact and line drives. We're trying, one, to, you know, to jump ship at least once a game, and we're going to sell out to do that yeah. and just give up everything else, and maybe Joey Gallo will run into a three-run homer. How about any of those two strike flares right over first base? The, you've been, the, those you are see beautiful. Right, and, oh, that made my career. Goes in the and then you have the squibbers that go four feet, right? It still goes yeah. in as a line drive in the book, right? right and baby. people are just well, how how do you hit three? And that's what you do. Those those little flares, the guy guys running. You know, you, sometimes you don't have a sign. Guys taking off, and you see it. You ask how you see it. It's just we're used to the speed of the game. When we see a guy, they one you hear him yelling. So you know something's over the plate. You're trying to shoot it through that hole because you can see who's covering. Yeah, and and that's just he said this is what we were able to see in doing that. Okay, there's a cheap hit. Just it doesn't it barely gets through the dirt, but the second baseman's already moving across, and you've just hit one off your knuckles through there and getting a base hit out of and it. And it feels just as good as a rocket. Oh yeah. And, because, and to us, they weren't cheap hits. Mm-mm. They're hits. And we worked yeah, at there ex- are no expanding cheap the hits. zone. I had so many hits like this on two strikes to the opposite field, just by making contact. If you put the ball in play. Something good can happen because it makes up for those rockets you hit at people yeah. or something else, and then oh, this supposedly is they break right. even, but we know they don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's that's just a part. It's just that's that's what was fun about it. You you, you would see that little stuff. Even, I mean, it's like I said. I don't. I like seeing guys bunt. I'm trying to think if there's ever been a bunt this whole year since they've done this whole DH. I'm gonna go through that and see. Not just, very often. And it, let me ask you about the shift. How easy would it have been for you to hit a ground ball to second base with three guys on the left side of the infield? Maggie, 3,000 hit. Hit behind a runner. Yeah. Shoot right. That's easy money. It's just like a guy on third base with less than two outs. And the infield's back. All you got to do is put the ball in play on the ground. Ground ball up the middle. Get it past the pitcher. What are they doing? They're popping. Yes, because it's, they just, they're thinking too much. It has to be, now they've got full body armor. They do. I mean, you might as well hit in full catcher's gear, yeah. right? But now the face guard, the, the elbow guard, the knee hand guard. Hand guards, too. The hand, oh, the hand? I mean, what, what do no you... No fear of getting hit no, <laughs> no, and you're not. And then, so what So, so what, do they, what do they teach you? Why, but yet you can't You can't run into anybody. You can't do that. But yet you, the hitters can get protected and all that. It's just the sport just has not not the same for when we grew up. We were at, we were at a hockey game, and people asked, are there any more fighters? I said... Oh, they don't have them anymore. They weeded them out, right? That, because it's not, it's you, the, if they're going to fight, you better be able to put the puck in the net, right? Same, if you're going to hit home runs if, and hit 200, you better be able to play some defense or something. Mm-hmm. It's not, there's no, uh, and the way the numbers are, I mean, the analytics, like Babe Ruth's got to be spinning in a grave. War, defensive replacement. What, what is this stuff? What is it? It's nauseating. It's baseball. That's what it is. It's made up It's billy ball. It's made up stats. It's Billy Ball that's that's taken over the numbers. We have guys that never put on a jock, but the numbers say that it's going to be this way, and that's what you need to do, and that's what they're basing it off of, as opposed to what we see. Like you said, we don't go in there and look at videos. All no, we're out there watching the game to see how this whole thing's going to develop. But no, there's no more learning. It's being it's it's being they have to be taught what to do. Kids. So did analytics guys ever come up to you and say, hey? I want to show you something here. And the first time that happened to you, what was your reaction to it? I don't think anybody ever did. And if, I, if, if like you said, if some of our coaches, like if I just said something to Rudy about analytics, he probably would have put me in a headlock. Yeah. And wouldn't after let he go. punched you. After, yeah, <laughs> after he tackled me and said, what are you, what are you doing? And what me, are you trying to do to yourself? And let me tell you something about Rudy. He's an Oak Cliff guy. Yes, the mad Mexican. That and, man would. And he was known. You know, he had a off. reputation. Oh yes, <laughs> and, oh yes, and that's what it is. It's just it's this. It's you have to be taught, right? We we yeah. were able to react to things, right? Guys now tagging up from second base, they're looking at 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 the coach. Yeah. What am I <laughs> Guy hits the ball to right center, and he's rounding the second, and he's looking at the at the third base coach when he's supposed to already know. You read that ball after you hit it. Funny story about Rudy Hadamia. I used to listen to your show, The Hard Line, a lot. And I still remember what you used to say about Rudy Jaramillo. I said, nobody messed with Rudy Jaramillo. Yeah, that's if you it. went to Oak Cliff, yeah. you watched out for Rudy Jaramillo. Yes, everybody <laughs> knew him and nobody messed with him. And we him. all loved him because we knew he died for us. He wanted us to be 
successful more than we wanted to be successful. He was a great guy. Oh, great. I talked to him two weeks ago. Benji Gill just took a job um, coaching on the coaching staff of the Angels. Um, and Rudy Hottam, they hired Rudy Hottamillo as a hitting coach in the Meyer Leagues, him and his nephew. Um, Tony? And he, yep. Yeah, and so Rudy called me. Benji sent me a picture of him and Rudy in the locker room. And, and, uh, and Rudy called me. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. He was great. Awesome guy. So we were so we were talking earlier tonight or today about how you were how you first met Reiner and you. I'm going to hear about this conversation you guys had <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, it was 19, um, 1990. Wait a minute, am I, I, I going to like this? Yeah. <laughs> you don't 19, have a choice, Mike. <laughs> I used to listen to Hardline live. I went on the Hardline a few times. Um, 1995. I was playing for the Rangers. We're in Detroit, and I was playing. Sporadically, Macklemore was uh, platooning at second with me, and then Mac was playing in the outfield. And um, I've mended fences with Mac. We're buddies now, <laughs> and we did some some stuff on Fox together. But at the time, I was pissed because I felt like I should be playing more. Mm -hmm. And you guys asked me to come on your show, and so from my hotel room in Detroit, um, I did your radio show. And the first question was, well, "We want to talk to you about your playing time." <laughs> and I said, "What playing time?" Yeah. I said, I, I, can, I, can, I can name you seven times I've got two or more hits in a game <clears throat> and not played the next day, so I don't know what playing time you're talking about. And by the time I got to the field, Doug Melvin had already called my hotel room looking for me, and as soon as I walked into the, the locker room in Detroit, Danny Wheat, the trainer, walked up to me. I mean, I was two steps in the locker room. He goes, Johnny wants to see you. So I walked in his office, knew what was about to happen, and he goes, shut the door, and I shut the door, and he goes, I don't know why you did what you did. I said, what did I do, Johnny? He goes, well, you went on a local radio station and said all this stuff. I said, I told the truth. I said, you can't give me a good reason why I'm not in the lineup. So I said, everybody knows who your favorite player is on the team. So he goes, well, we'll just finish out this year and go our separate ways. We can choose our friends at the end. I said, works for me. And I hardly played at all. But what it accomplished was the next year I went to the Red Sox. And so I was looking for a way to get out of town. Um, I knew that I had to do something because I was miserable sitting on the bench. And I felt like I was playing good enough to play. And you helped me with that. So right? we effectively got you, you out of there. Sir, right. you, you and the hammer. <laughs> do you think that happens these days anymore? Guys going into managers and saying that? I think there's probably a couple guys that might. But I think for the most part, they don't. Um, I know I was had respect for our managers, but I also had fear of our managers back then. I was there were certain things that you probably shouldn't say to your manager, and if he said this is the way it is, you didn't question it. And I see some of the guys managing around baseball now, and I'm not sure they garner the same respect as the guys that we had. You know, my first manager was Toby Hara. Yeah, he is. You didn't say anything to Toby Hara. Okay, he, he, I made an excuse one time, and he jumped my case, and I never made another excuse, I promise you. And I just don't think that a lot of the managers now, that are more like figureheads in the game, and I don't think they command the same respect as a Tony La Russa, Sparky yeah, Anderson, yeah. Whitey Herzog, those guys. They're you there to question corral Billy the Martin. You wouldn't question those guys. No. You knew what was Not good for, for nothing. you. You'd never see the field. Even if the guys that they're managing today that have played at that level and that excelled at that level, you still don't think they, they get that respect? I think those guys do. But imagine as a major league player, you get there and the, your manager now um, never played professional baseball. He doesn't know the pressure that we felt, that we put every day I was going to the field with a little bit of anxiety. Every single day of my career, a little bit nervous that I might embarrass myself and my family. I mean, it lessened lessened over time when you get more comfortable. But you remember those first few years you're in the big leagues, man. It was nerve wracking. Just going to the field, you're like, oh man, am I playing today? And then once you saw you're in the lineup, then more anxiety built toward the game. And then once you started playing, it went away. But it was before the game. I always had it. I don't know if you did. It's it, some managers were that way. They would have it where. Hey, Jeff, you're going to be off tomorrow. 
just do whatever you need to do and then come in, just be, just be ready. They would tell you that, one, especially the ones that had played at the level, under, mm -hmm. like you said, understand the daily grind of what you go into. Um, you know, like, you, like they do in spring training. You knew you weren't going to play. You're not going to play tomorrow or whatever. So, you know, you go out and play golf, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what, but let, now I, I'm sure it's just probably, it, like you said, it's just all over the place. Well, you never know the lineup. You yep. don't have consistent lineups anymore yep. because some intern upstairs is the guy bringing down the lineup to the manager and saying, all right, this is the lineup we think gives us the best chance to win today. Yeah, I know what happened in Minnesota with Ron Gardenhire. Intern brought down the lineup thinking it was a left-handed pitcher and it was a right-handed pitcher. and He brought the long, wrong lineup out. And can you imagine somebody walking in Billy Martin's office and saying, here you go, Skip, this is the lineup. I can't imagine. That guy would have never, he would have, he would have not been able to get out of that. I can't <laughs> imagine somebody walking in anybody's office and not knowing who's pitching that day. Yeah. But that's about the numbers. That's it's all the, based on numbers. The probabilities and algorithms and all this stuff. And it, you, I mean, you had a certain lineup where basically seven, you knew seven dudes were playing that day. Right. Regardless if it was righty or lefty. You know, you knew mm -hmm. you were having Goody leading off. You have uh, Will Clark at first base. Pudge was catching. Rusty's in right. You're in left. You know, mm -hmm. Elster's at short. You know, you knew that was the lineup. Okay, maybe somebody's scuffling, so a utility guy will play that day or an extra outfielder. Or maybe Pudge has caught seven games in a row, so Dave Valley's going to catch or something like yeah. that. You knew there was a little fluctuation. Now every day is like, Picking names out of a hat. Who's playing today? Yeah. yeah. You know? They're starting a righty opener who's going to throw one inning, and they're going to try to turn our whole lineup over, so we're going to start lefties, and then they're going to bring in a lefty and, and totally screw us for the day. And that, you, that just didn't happen back in the day. Well, boys, have you had fun here today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just I trying mean, to see. Like this I said, is, different perspective. This is the Big Head Podcast. This is yours. It is. The Big Head Podcast. Like I said, one to get, to get <clears throat> Jeff... Just to see and, and understand what, what you know how how we see things yeah. as, and then maybe how the rest of the world sees this stuff because they're starting they're buying into all the BS and it's not that's what we're trying to get rid of and that's what Jeff's trying to get rid of so kids aren't they're not getting ripped off and just learning the game of baseball learn to love it again so and keep playing exactly and exactly. it's got to be fun for kids or they're going to choose something else that's right exactly. that's all there is to it you take the fun out of it and that's it but we appreciate it appreciate you coming in jeff with your with yeah your thanks for having she gone me. nation uh with mike reiner coming in for uh your dark companion you can check this out on the dub network and we look forward to seeing you guys again